good afternoon to those of you who have joined our Association of Moving Image Archivists webinar this afternoon. Um, before we dive into the full 90 minutes that we have ahead for you, I want to ensure that everyone can hear us loud and clear. So I'm just going to do a quick sound check. Um, for those of you who have already participated in EMEA calls, uh, webinars, this will be familiar to you. In your control panel in front of you, there is the opportunity to, quote, raise your hand. If folks can raise their hand, if they can, in fact, uh, hear me this afternoon, um, that'll give us a good inclination whether our, uh, everything's working for us today. Okay, I see a number of hands uh, going up. Thank you so much. Um, this is a good chance for you to also just take a look at the control panel in front of you. Um, if you haven't used it before, the GoToTraining interface, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand during the session, um, as well as uh, enter questions via the chat box, which is at the bottom um, of the control panel. So thanks so much. Um, I want to welcome and thank you all uh, for joining us this afternoon. This is the sixth webinar in a series that we put together on uh, introduction to digital formats and storage quite broadly. We've had sessions uh, specifically looking at audio and video, and today is the first of two sessions looking at film formats and resolution. My name is Kimberly Tarr, and I'm speaking with you all today from New York University. Um, I'm also joined on the line uh, by Eric Peel, our instructor, who will, I will introduce shortly. Um, we have a really wonderful presentation put together, and good morning and good afternoon. I, I realize there are, are folks uh, joining us both uh, here on the East Coast, Central Coast, um, I'm sorry, Central uh, Time Zone, as well as the West Coast, and I know a number of folks from the attendee list look like they're joining us from Europe today as well. So this session is being recorded, ah, 7 p.m. in the evening for Andrew, um, great. So we are expecting a really great turnout today, and for those of you um, interested in reviewing the content subsequent to, the, to the, today's session, a recording uh, is being made, and you will be notified of um, how you can access that um, after we wrap up today. So um, logistical information, uh, you have all joined in listen-only mode. But that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We just have so many folks on the, on the line. Uh, we'll ask you to send along your questions and comment via the chat box uh, within uh, the software. So um, I want to make sure that we have time to get to your, all of your questions. And um, so Eric will I'll talk a little bit more about um, whether or not you know, he can tackle questions during or at the end. Um, I can assure you that we've carved out time at the at the tail end so that we can get to your questions. If he doesn't, um, if he isn't able to to tackle them during the presentation. Um, additionally, there is a materials tab in the webinar interface, and it either says the word materials or it looks like a piece of paper. Um, and it's in that tab that you can download. A PDF of today's presentation, a PDF of the resource list, and also a PDF of frequently asked questions regarding the EMEA webinar series. So um, this is, as I mentioned, the first of two sessions looking at uh, film format resolution and workflow. Um, Eric Peel will be teaching uh, today's session this afternoon as well as Thursdays. So um, I hope to see many of you there as well. Uh, by way of introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Eric Peel and then invite him to join us. Eric is a media conservator at the Cramlett Collection, New Art Trust in New York City, and an adjunct professor at NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preser Preservation Program, where he teaches video preservation. He was formerly the digital archivist at Anthology Film Archives, where he oversaw the in-house digital reformatting initiatives of various audio, video, and film formats, including Super 8, 16 millimeter, and 35 millimeter motion picture film. He's currently working on developing methods for file format conformance checking through the EU-funded Preforma project as a member of Team MediaConch, who are specializing on the Matroska, FFV1, and LP 
PCM format. So um, I want to welcome uh, Eric. Eric, hello. Hello. How's everyone doing? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And uh, folks, if you can hear Eric on the line as well, if you can just let us know either in the chat uh, or thank you, Rebecca, or uh, raising of the hand. OK, great. I know that Eric has a lot of information to cover. Um, uh, if you need anything, Eric, I'm on the line with you. But at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Kim. Um, so as Kim said, this is the sixth webinar of the series in which I'll be discussing digital film formats. Um, and again, my name is Eric Peel. I'm the, uh, a conservator at the Kremlin Collection, which is a private art collection in New York City. Um, and then those interested in sending me um, uh, questions following this webinar can do so at the um, email you see there. It's also in the uh, resources PDF. So before I begin, I just want to clarify the title of this webinar and asking what exactly am I talking about when I'm referring to digital film formats? Am I referring to Kodak's machine-readable key numbering system applied to film and used for digital editing and matchbacks? Not really. Am I referring to the film file format developed by Sega in the early 2000s for their CD-ROM and Sega home video consoles? Uh, nope. In the context of this webinar, I'll be using the term digital film formats to refer to the following items. File formats used in the analog to digital conversion of motion picture film, photochemical film, such as the DPX format. File formats used in contemporary digital motion picture cameras for feature film and television production, such as RE RAW. And file formats and specifications used in digital cinema exhibition such as DCPs or digital cinema packages. Here's a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. First, I'm going to go over some basic characteristics of motion picture film, as well as some traditional methods for reformatting film to video uh, and digital media. Then I'll discuss brief concepts of film digitization, including descriptions of various digital film formats encountered along the way, as well as some target file formats for preservation and access. At the end of this webinar, we'll have a brief questions and answers session to clarify any of the points made. Because this webinar is primarily focused on file formats used in the analog to digital conversion of motion picture film, Let's begin by just briefly going over the standards and characteristics that we typically find in film. Motion picture film contains specifications such as format, aspect ratio, perforation type, and pitch. It contains systems like polarity and sound. It's important to ask ourselves moving forward, how do we properly translate these elements meaningfully into digital media? We also have characteristics of film, such as base type, color, and granularity. Characteristics imposed by camera and projector operators, lab technicians, and film manufacturers, such as projection speed, film wind, and stock type. We also have characteristics of film that occur over time. A film can shrink or stretch. It can become brittle. Color films can fade. They can develop mold from harsh environments. And they can suffer abuse from the practice of projection, such as residue from adhesives, splices, dust, dirt, and scratches. Now, prior to film scanning, there was and still is the process of converting film images to video, which is commonly known as telecine. While this process provides access to the content of film on video-centric display devices, such as televisions, the characteristics intrinsic to video, such as frame rate, color space, and resolution, make telecine a subpar process for archiving and preservation of motion picture film. 
For example, if you look at the diagram on the right, you'll notice that in some instances, the video to film process oftentimes adds additional composite and duplicate frames and fields to achieve the frame rate of video. In this case, we're looking at a film shown at 24 frames per second being converted to standard definition NTSC video at 29.97 frames per second. To the lower left, you'll also notice some rather complex frame and field duplication cadences to achieve the specifications of high definition interlace and progressive video formats. Film scanning, on the other hand, involves a reformatting of motion picture film into high resolution digital files. This process removes any of the previous limitations of video reproduction and allows an archivist to create a more accurate representation of film with all of its intrinsic characteristics. What are some additional possible rationales for scanning motion picture film? Some see digitization as a sustainable alternative to photochemical film preservation as film processing begins to subside in the coming years. Film scanning also allows a user to take advantage of a suite of digital restoration tools to remove oftentimes negative characteristics of film, like scratches. Or some might want to present a film's content on a contemporary electronic device, like a high definition monitor or a digital cinema projector. All of this can be done through scanning film. Now before getting into some examples of digital film formats, I'd like to briefly go over several key concepts of film digitization, such as color space encoding and lookup tables. Color spaces exist as mathematical models that help us group and organize colors the average human can see. They allow for reproducing representations of color in both analog and digital display devices. For example, most of us are used to hearing about YCBCR and YPBPR as a family of color spaces used to encode RGB information into analog and digital video systems. With film scanning, the primary color spaces consist of logarithmic or nonlinear RGB and linear RGB. Logarithmic, logarithmic encoding is designed to loosely mimic the printing density of film itself, allowing for a wide latitude of filmic information to be captured in the available bit depth. In this case, 10-bit is the norm for logarithmic encoding. The drawback, however, is that this color space is not designed for viewing on electronic or linear displays. Linear encoding, on the other hand, is in fact designed for use with electronic display devices. Linear encoding is oftentimes paired with 8, 12, or 16-bit depths. The metadata of a digital film file will elaborate on what color encoding specification is used. In the case of logarithmic encoding, the technical metadata will refer to the term printing density. In the case of linear encoding, the technical metadata of a file will refer to linear. This information can be retrieved through metadata extraction tools such as media info. Here's a quick example of the same frame of 16 millimeter film rendered in both logarithmic and linear color encodings and viewed on the same display device. Note how the logarithmic, logarithm, excuse me, logarithmic rendering on the left appears washed out, while the linear rendering on the right appears correct for the display device. Now, once a film is scanned in either a log or a linear color space, how can it be correctly viewed on a monitor? 
through a series of lookup tables, or LUTs. Lookup tables are a method of transforming color values from one set of codes to another. They can be used for calibrating display devices, converting bit depths, and moving through various color spaces. Lookup tables are everywhere in electronic imaging, and we usually don't notice them unless we're actively searching for them. QuickTime Player, for example, oftentimes uses a lookup table in their media player when a certain color space is mentioned in a file's metadata. Lookup tables are oftentimes encoded as proprietary file types that vary with software. As an example here, I've rendered a few lookup tables here as text files. What you can see here are mapped coordinates to a target color space. Lookup tables can also contain a transformation of code values to the next set of code values. In this instance, we have 10-bit code values. It's here that I'd like to mention that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has come up with, an, with the Academy Color Encoding Specification, or ACES, as a color management and image interchange system. ACES includes a suite of utilities, including an open source software library, transforms, and lookup tables, and literature for content creators and equipment vendors. The ACES team has recently developed an XML schema designed to document multiple color transformations and lookup tables, as well as any device-dependent information needed to properly apply color values from a given application. Here is an example of the proposed ACES XML that includes such information as a brief description of the lookup table itself, as well as the respective input and output bit depths. Now that we have some basic concepts of film digitization down, let's discuss some common file formats used in film scanning. These will include primarily the DPX, or Digital Moving Picture Exchange format, the TIFF, or Tagged Image File format, and the Blackmagic Cintel file format. These are what I like to call image acquisition formats or formats that come right off the scanner as the film is scanned. The DPX file format, short for Digital Moving Picture Exchange, was built on Kodak's original Cineon file format, which was used with early film scanning technology from the mid-1990s. It's now a SMPTE standard and has seen two revisions spanning a 20-year period. A DPX sequence consists of individual DPX images that are representative of the film frames themselves. This is otherwise known as an image stack. Note that this format is image only. There's no audio that can be contained in a DPX image stack. On the left, you'll see an 8-frame sample of a 16-millimeter positive film element. So it happens that I shot this footage myself quite a few years ago. To the right, you'll see the DPX file structure of this 8-frame sample, which consists of individual DPX files for each frame of film. A DPX header contains descriptive metadata related to the film itself. For example, information extracted from the key code edge information. It also contains TV information, including time code.
Here's that same information as represented in a media info trace report, which shows the metadata alongside its respective memory address or file offset. This information can be retrieved using the inform details flag on media info's command line toolset. So why do we use DPX as a preservation master file format for digitizing motion picture film? Its 20 plus year run as a SMPTE specification gives it a good reputation among the image science and technology industry. It also has features that make it somewhat future proof. As a container, it's resolution and color space agnostic. It also maintains a one-to-one -one ratio between a frame of film and an individual DPX file. DPX image stacks may prove to be an efficient form of granular bit level preservation for the long term. To show an example of DPX's interoperability, here's an individual DPX frame opened up in the open source image processing tool Graphics Magic. DPX sequences can also be played using the open source video processing tool FFmpeg, as well as professional tools like DaVinci Resolve. We've heard of the advantages of DPX, but what are its disadvantages? For starters, the files are very cumbersome. Feature length sequences get up to around two terabytes in size. It also takes a tremendous amount of processing power to read and write or copy DPX sequences, as a computer has to read each individual file header. Image sciences, scientists I'm sorry, have reported interoperability issues with DPX stemming from a lack of specification with regard to storage word size. A recent SMPTE standards quarterly report in March of 2015 described what they called significant, other, significant errors found in the standard, but a corrected version is forthcoming. Finally, while DPX is a SMPTE specification, its motion picture information contained in its header is in need of revision, or at least some level of shimming to serve the moving image archiving community better. Remember that DPX is our de facto digital preservation format for film and not something that was made with the moving image archiving community in mind. What about audio? The optical or magnetic audio track from the film itself is simply digitized in tandem with the creation of the DPX sequence in the form of a broadcast wave file. Synchronization of DPX image sequences and broadcast wave audio tracks may be difficult if both elements aren't digitized simultaneously. In some cases, one might find that digitizing a track from a print is preferred over a preservation track element. In this case, there may be some synchronization involved through subsequent nonlinear editing. Here I've laid out some target file formats and specifications for 35 millimeter film. File format is a DPX. Resolution, a minimum of 4K, meaning 4096 pixels horizontally. Color space, as we discussed, either logarithmic or linear. And a bit depth, preferably 10 bit for logarithmic or 12 or 16 bit for linear. If there is an audio track, broadcast wave as a wrapper and also uh, PCM uh, as, the, as the 
uncompressed codec with a bit depth and a sampling rate of 24 bits or 96 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz. And here are some target um, file formats and specifications for digitizing 16 millimeter film and by extension other small gauge formats. Again, DPX file formats, this time with a resolution of 2K or 2048 pixels horizontally, um, logarithmic or linear RGB color spaces, and similar bit depths, 10 bit for logarithmic or 12 or 16 bit for linear. Of course, other file formats can be used for image acquisition in film scanning, some of which are even preferred given the type of equipment involved. For example, Blackmagic Sintel has also developed a DPX-like file format for their new reworked film scanner, premiering later this year. Originally defined by Aldis and now under the control of Adobe, the tagged image file format, or TIFF, is a well-documented file format for uncompressed still images. The TIFF file format shows flexibility through the use of several metadata schemes, such as EXIF or XMP information. However, it is not known that all TIFF readers are able to read TIFF images, even if they conform completely with the standard. It's here that I would like to briefly mention the TI slash A standard initiative project, which stands for Tagged Image for Archival, also known loosely as TIFF A. This project, funded by the European Union's Performa project, consists of a group of experts focusing on the definition of a specification of an archival TIFF format, with hopes to create a new ISO standard focusing on archiving the format itself. While an ARRI RAW file is not another image acquisition digital film format, its acquisition comes not from a film scanner, but of a digital cinema camera, specifically the ARRI Alexa. You'll notice the similarities, however, with the aforementioned DPX file format. The ARRI RAW format features a similar image stack with logarithmic color encoding. I'll also briefly mention here Blackmagic's Sintel RAW format designed to be used in conjunction with Blackmagic's new line of Sintel film scanners. Again, this digital film format features a similar style image stack. Not much has been released by Blackmagic regarding this format, so I'm hoping to analyze this format further in the future. Now that we have our digital files of scanned film, it's time to start briefly thinking about derivatives in terms of exhibition. I know that many of you will be interested in creating digital cinema packages or DCPs. This is the basic structure of a digital cinema package which includes um, such XML files as um, volume index, which indicates whether a DCP spans over multiple hard drives, as well as a MXF wrapped uh, JPEG 2000 with uh, a broadcast wave audio file. Digital cinema packages also have uh, laid out a file naming convention for all digital, for the DCI, I'm sorry, 
the DCI Consortium has laid out a file naming convention for all digital cinema packages. In this file naming convention is information related to a film's title, aspect ratio, content type, available language, audio type, resolution, and other information. Um, I want to point out here um, the available resources that you have as PDFs. Um, they are going to link you to all of the um, relevant file format standard specifications that I've discussed today. Um, and also point you to um, software that could be used for um, the manipulation of these image acquisition files as well as transcoding to um, derivative file formats like QuickTime or MXF and then also relevant um, books or articles. In addition, um, I've created a little repository in GitHub um, that has several DPX sample files that will allow you to um, perform these transcoding processes on your own and be able to look at the file metadata of, of a DPX file and um, just get more uh, acquainted with it. Um, the uh, URL to this repository will be available um, in the resources list. So um, I implore everyone to um, take a look at the repository and download the contents and um, take a look and, and, and uh, perform, um, you know, preservation activities on them. So this just highlights the upcoming webinars in the series. I know we kind of blew through digital film formats, but um, part two is really going to elaborate on uh, digital film workflows. So how do you move from uh, an image acquisition file to making uh, derivatives for access across all these different um, uh, display devices and platforms. Uh, so I encourage everybody to join us uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, for that, which I'll be teaching as well. Um, and then also, um, Barry Lunt is going to be teaching a webinar on digital storage and infrastructure um, this, the following Tuesday. So I know I have about uh, an hour's worth of questions and answers, so um, let's, let's get to it. I know I blew through some of the chat questions. Hey, Eric. Thank you so much. This is Kim. Um, it seems like we have a number of questions that have come through uh, via chat. I'll give you a, a chance to take a look. Um, there's been some good dialogue about um, different scanning equipment that, that folks are using in the field. Um, one issue that I wanted to bring up and uh, ask you to address was um, thinking about uh, Demetrius at Inter Internet Archive was asking about uh, access preferred specifications versus preservation. And in thinking about um, that divide, um, how perhaps uh, folks that are interested in uh, digitizing, scanning and digitizing their film might, uh, the considerations that they might make in thinking about uh, preservation versus access. So I think, I mean, obviously, yes, there is a, a big divide in what you get in terms of a DPX file. And then also, um, you know, what your, what your target access file is. But I feel like um, once you weigh the costs of um, scanning and uh, digital storage, that um, ideally you want to have this mandate in which you want to scan a film at, its, at the highest resolution that you can. Um, and then from there create your um, your derivatives for access purposes. Um, keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to scan to DPX or TIFF. Um, you can obviously have a vendor scan to something a little bit more down the line like a um, 
MXF wrapped JPEG 2000 with a broadcast WAV file or um, an Apple ProRes file. Um, but these are going to limit you in the future to um, specific uh, video color spaces, uh, for example, high definition television. Um, with scanning to DPX, um, you're allowing yourself to um, be able to push out into other um, environments. And this means possibly for digital cinema exhibition um, or um, any kind of future color space that could be designed uh, for, for display devices or exhibition. So I s right. Um, right. there's a question here about the TIA, DCDM, and an RGB space or an XYZ space. Um, so I did not go over that, but um, the way that TIFF files factor into this is um, in the creation of a digital cinema package, normally um, what you would do is you'd consider the DPX and the broadcast WAV file to be your um, digital source master. And then from there, you would encode to a TIFF uh, file, which would be uh, in a 12-bit uh, XYZ space. So there's a conversion of color spaces there. And then from there, you would make an MXF uh, wrapped uh, JPEG 2000 and broadcast wave file for, um, for digital cinema packages. So that's where kind of TIFF factors in uh, to it. You can also scan to TIFF um, as, an, as an image acquisition format. So why is the target recommended resolution for 16 millimeter film 2K and 35 millimeter 4K? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the conventional wisdom here is that um, the information contained in 16 millimeter film roughly amounts to um, the digital equivalent of 2K worth of resolution. Um, so what do I mean by 2K? I mean 2048 pixels by 1080 pixels. Um, and then kind of the equivalent with 35 millimeter. Um, but the information contained in 35 millimeter film more or less amounts to uh, 4K worth of resolution. Um, one thing I did not include in the resources that basically um, talks about this is a um, white paper by Ari, um, which basically did the homework here on how to equate um, analog film information with digital resolution. And feel free to email me and I'll send you a link to that. Just scanning the questions here. Um, what is edge information? Edge information is information that's kind of inscribed on the edge of motion picture film to indicate um, multiple things like a, a, a manufacturing year, for example. Um, I know that everyone loves Kodak's edge codes, which have um, manufacturers years that are kind of coded in symbols so um, square triangle circle um, things like that so these are kind of like uh, um, very good archival um, uh, kind of traces um, of determining the uh, year of manufacture for film and and the things like that So um, Julian writes, are the differences between the log and linear encoding images due to them being shown in electronic display? Or to put it in another way, controlling for displays, what are the advantages of log versus linear color encoding? So I think the main takeaway with this webinar is that um, controlling 
color information throughout various display devices is really crucial. Um, now what you're doing is you're scanning film essentially in a color space that is not um, easily viewable on an electronic display device. Um, this needs uh, a log to a linear lookup table just to be able to view it um, on, on an electronic display device. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that this kind of logarithmic encoding was originally designed to um, go back out onto film. So you're basically, it's not designed to be viewed in an electronic display device, but um, it's more or less used to record, to do what's known as a film out. Um, and now this logarithmic encoding was a means to that end. Um, and although um, it's been around since the mid-1990s, um, people still use logarithmic encoding um, within their DPX files. So this is another thing to talk to vendors about. Um, you know, whether your DPX files are getting encoded in either logarithmic or linear. So I see that uh, Demetrius has sent, submitted a link to the FADGI um, statement of work um, with regard to film scanning. This is actually something that I'm going to go over on Thursday. Um, it's, a, it's actually a really great document. It came out um, um, I think about a month ago, and it really lays out um, a lot of these ideas that we're talking about now um, with what you're actually getting when you're scanning film and what to move forward through time in terms of file formats. So, so does the TIFF format incorporate audio? No, it doesn't. It's an image-only uh, um, format uh, like DPX. Let me scroll up. Does the RE RAW format contain audio? No, it's image only. Um, can you talk a little bit more about lookup tables when you have a chance? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, you know, so as I mentioned, lookup tables are these um, almost like proprietary um, uh, little text files that you know move through different software applications um, that basically transform the image to um, the, the proper viewing environment. Um, and what the Academy has been doing has been trying to make these things a little bit more transparent. So when you um, uh, when you scan a film and you're moving it through different display environments, so for example. Um, someone who's like color correcting a film, a DPX file, might be working on a monitor that has a color space that's the equivalent of, of high definition video. Um, they have to apply this lookup table down the line to do their necessary color correcting. So what the Academy is trying to do is um, create a little bit more of a standardized lookup table that can be carried as like a sidecar file with um, the digital film asset over time so that way people looking at this file can kind of distinguish oh how has it moved through certain color spaces how has it been interpreted by display environments over time So um, there's another TIFF question. Can TIFF be used with sound film, or is it only meant for silent? 
um, again, it's an image only um, uh, file format and that the accompanying audio from a track would most typically be digitized in a broadcast WAV file. And then those would kind of live um, in proximity with one another. Uh, there's a question about perforation type and pitch. Um, so f motion picture film has um, different kinds of preparations according to the polarity. So um, negative film will have a certain type of perforation type. Um, positive film will have a certain type of perforation type. Um, the spaces between perforations, that's, what's, that's what the, the pitch is so-called called. called. Um, these, um, if you want to get a little bit more in depth with, prefer with preparation type and pitch, there's a wonderful book called um, The Restoration of Motion Picture Film by Paul Reed and Mark Paul Meyer. Um, we will send you a link. Feel free to read up on, on those, um, those characteristics. Is there good software to play back DPX of audio? It's a good question. Um, I usually use DaVinci Resolve. Um, that provides a very good um, interface for uh, viewing uh, DPX image sequences with audio. And then from there, you're also able to push out um, to various uh, access copies, be it Pro ProRes or H.264 or something like that. What's your thoughts on DNHD? Um, I don't have too many thoughts on it. I know that it is kind of like a mid-level um, kind of access file. Um, I'll follow up on that and maybe email the audience. Ben Moskowitz, with edge-to-edge -edge scans, or open matte films, do you need to create crop derivatives, or can you direct a player to matte the DPX? Um, this is an interesting thing. Um, one thing I did not mention is that you can basically scan film with the optical track exposed, and then there's a tool called AO Sound that extracts the audio from the image itself. Um, so that is a kind of a more of a um, marginalized way of scanning film, um, but it is available. Um, but I think in many instances what people will do is that they will scan films, um, if one could consider an overscan portion, um, they will scan a little bit over the edges. Um, that will allow for um, the necessary a stabilization um, to happen um, in, in case stabilization was needed. And then from there, if you're going to create a derivative, you would, um, you would obviously crop um, and uh, crop to the actual frames of, of the, uh, the film information. Oh, so Kim mentioned the book I just talked about. It's a great book. Everyone should buy it. So, Eric, as folks uh, consider additional questions and answer those into uh, the chat box, um, can you say a little bit about how Thursday's session will differ from today's and what type of information you'll be covering in terms of the workflow components? Yeah, so um, oh boy. Um, Thursday's webinar will kind of talk about um, basically everything you need to create a statement of work to submit to a vendor um, for scanning film. Um, and also, I'll kind of talk about my um, in-house workflows on scanning film and how, um, you know, 
one could one should set up a system for quality control of um, getting back scanned film and uh, being able to have a one-to-one -one relationship with the vendor saying this this is this oh, the scan is okay um, you know things like that um, I mean right this webinar kind of briefly went over some of the some of the major file formats that you would be encountering and hopefully moving forward through time through archiving but the Thursday webinar will be more focused on um, workflows and then also like building um, a statement of work to be submitted out to a, a film scanning vendor. Great, great. Thanks for the um, clarification and the differentiation. Um, I think Jordan had another uh, question about preserving uh, crop film scans or edge to edge. Any concerns about preserving crop film scans or would you suggest edge to edge scans? I d so edge to edge scans to me are are interesting. Um, I, I wrote a paper about this like a few years ago, um, in that it, they do contain edge information that can't necessarily be easily deciphered um, through a description. Um, but scanning edge to edge requires um, a film scanner to be able to do that, and some film scanners can't do that um, because they have certain um, uh, mechanical um, components that don't allow them to scan edge to edge, and also when you're scanning edge to edge, you have um, you're exposed to certain light leaks um, and uh, certain qu qualities that you will have to um, basically adjust color correction wise. Um, so, like I like I said before, I think an ideal situation is scanning um, just outside of the um, edge of the film and then from there you're able to apply um, any kind of destabilization. You're really looking at the perforations and seeing if any destabilization is happening on the part of the film scanner or if it's happening within the content itself. So then you're able to apply um, certain digital restoration tools if you need to. And Andrew mentions that, yeah, edge to edge does lower the resolution of the active picture area. I would say in those instances, maybe going, going a higher resolution would be recommended. Um, the specifications that I've laid out are mostly for interframe scanning and not necessarily edge to edge scanning. Again, edge to edge scanning is kind of like a marginalized um, preservation activity at this point. I'm hoping that more information will come forth um, about workflows for doing that. So Rito uh, comes in and says we do edge to edge in 3.3K for real 2K and 6.6K for a real 4K image. So there you have it. So, Mike, about your question, you say, I keep asking about TIFF and sound. Um, so, yeah, DPX is kind of independent of the sound element that would be transferred. Um, you, you would only have an instance like MXF where it would be taking um, an image and an audio asset and, and, and wrapping them together. Um, DPX and Broadcast Wave and TIFF and Broadcast Wave are, are mostly independent from one another. This is a good question, Catherine. Um, can you talk about the ACES color space in relation to archival preservation workflows? Do you see ACES and OpenEXR being adopted instead of DPX in the next few years? Um, I do see, I, th I think I would like to see um, DPX uh, be used in conjunction with um, 
the, the newly developed ACES color space. So um, just to pull back a bit, instead of logarithmic or linear encoding, um, ACES is actually creating their own um, co color space for film scanning technology. And um, what this would do is kind of be able to uh, assist in tracking um, these changes in color space um, th throughout the lifespan of the asset. Um, so I'm kind of hoping to see that happen um, in, in, work, in, in, in workflows. Um, again, it, this technology is so fresh, um, it's, it's, only been, it's only several years old. So um, hopefully at this point, um, the film scanner vendors who create the scanners will um, be able to um, adapt like the ACES specifications with, within their own scanning technology. And by extension, um, Open EXR, which is a format developed by um, Industrial Light and Magic, kind of in a similar instance where they're trying to um, really pin down color management, um, but instead of having scan film to deal with, you also have um, uh, graphics and, and animation and, and things like that coming from multiple uh, different kinds of color spaces. So Kim writes, what are the primary considerations for bit depth selection? How should archives think through these options? Um, so for the most part, film scanning in logarithmic color space will happen in 10 bit. Um, now, there is some literature that will say that um, logarithmic scanning in 10-bit more or less equates to 16-bit um, linear scanning um, because this kind of um, color encoding and logarith log logarithmic encoding um, makes better use of the, of the bit depth. Um, so when I say 10-bit logarithmic, you can kind of more or less equate that to if you were to put a, a log to lin lookup table, you can more or less equate that to a 16-bit linear space. Um, currently, you have film scanners that are coming out with 12-bit, 16-bit linear uh, encoding. So while Eric and I come through the um, chat box to make sure that we've addressed uh, all of the questions that have percolated to date, um, please feel free to send uh, along additional questions or concepts that need uh, clarification for you. Um, we want to make sure that the film format, that this conversation or the, the digital film format that we're talking about today, that these issues are clear before we prepare for Thursday session, which I imagine many of you will be joining us for. So I know, Eric, you talked a little bit about perforation type and uh, pitch. I'm not sure if there's, if there's more uh, to say about it in, in regard to scanning at this point. Are there any other issues to consider? Um, not not typically. Um, you do um, you know with with with, scan, with archival film scanners. Um, I should mention that you want to be able to talk to the vendor and you want to be able to understand the film scanner that they are using. Um, some scanners operate in more of like an optical printing kind of manner, where um, an image will be registered and then scanned as opposed to um, a scanner that consists of particle transfer rollers that um, move um, the film forward in like a, with like a cap stand um, and, and, and relative tension. Um, so 
you really want to be able to understand um, not only the like characteristics of the film, like I mentioned, like the perforation type and pitch, um, as well as the film scanner. So if you're sending, you know, a, a negative that has, um, you know, um, a, a certain type of a, a BH, per, a, you know, perforation. I, I might be messing that up there, and a vendor film scanner cannot handle that, and they so happen to do this optical printing type registration, uh, then you, you know, you want to have that conversation before they go forward with the scanning, or at least you want to be able to select vendors um, with, with, this, with this in mind. So Catherine may sent a link to a handy diagram showing how ACEs in relation to um, different kinds of color spaces uh, laid out in the um, 1931 CIE chromaticity diagram. So this basically shows um, sRGB, Adobe RGB, those common computer display devices, monitors, um, DCI, which is mostly for digital cinema, and then ACES, which kind of uh, envelopes everything. Great, thanks so much, Catherine, for sending along um, that link as well. Um, doesn't seem as if other questions. Ah, Ian has a question. Light is shown through film and projected, while digital film projection is based on a different presentation method. What are some considerations when transferring from the former to the latter? Um. Well, I can say that, you know, well, let me just first off say that since we can still do photochemical preservation, that this is something that should be done in conjunction with film scanning. Given, um, you know, what, whatever project, you should most likely be photochemically preserving films when you have the opportunity. Um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, it's scanning film and then projecting film digitally and then showing film photochemically is um, phenomenologically different. Um, and, yeah, these considerations have to happen um, depending on the content. You know, for example, if your film is, um, you know, an experimental film that um, you know, where luminosity is the central character, then you are going to take that into consideration with preservation, hopefully both photochemically and uh, digitally. I know that many many individuals are considering, um, you know, undoubtedly archive with huge film collections and the changing demands for access today and getting things up online. There's a, undoubtedly a great deal of pressure. I want to just go back to the issue um, in thinking about access and preservation, Eric, and thinking that you know individuals who are are, are scanning at lower resolution resolution today. Um, in hopes of doing higher resolution, resolution in the future, kind of that tension, um, and and how how folks might be able to approach their collection um, it, with that tension for preservation and for access. Um, I, I mean, I think you just have to find um, a common ground and be able to. Take a look at your, you know, your, 
institutions' storage capabilities and, um, you know, if, for lack of a term, like what maybe um, interim preservation master files you are um, normalizing to. So, yeah, I mean, is it, can an institution um, save every film as a DPX image stack? Probably not. You're going to have to, um, you know, make those heavy decisions um, down the line. But I mean, I think the philosophy is to, you know, scan at the highest resolution possible, at with a format that can um, encompass the latitude of film, um, and then from there be able to make derivatives in the future. Um, yeah, and, and obviously we live in a real-world scenario where we can't we can't save preservation master files that are that big, um, at least for at least in, over an entire collection. So, yeah, decisions have to be made, um, and then of course that goes downhill to, you know, um, it's almost similar to you know video preservation. Like, are you going to save everything to an uncompressed 10-bit QuickTime file? Probably not. Um, you're going to have to make some serious decisions on lossless file formats uh, or compressed file formats and so forth. Great. Um, thanks so much, Eric. I. Um, I know we have both. Uh, we have your email address up on the screen currently, um, and if individuals have further questions, I'm going to recommend that they reach out to you directly. Uh, there was a white paper that you mentioned a little bit ago, Eric, that I can. Um, I know uh, Lindsay and a few other folks had um, asked for the link, so we'll be sure to um, get that out to you as well. Um, and then we'll we'll. Plan to pick up again uh, this Thursday afternoon for the second part um, of our EMEA webinars in dealing with digital film formats and workflow. Really, the emphasis will be on workflow and both um, in house and also um, developing a request for proposals for vendors as well. So, that will be this Thursday at the same time, same place, 2 to 3 30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and uh, I don't see any other uh, other questions materializing, so I think um, we'll we'll wrap up now and look forward uh, to having many of you back again on Thursday. Eric, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close out? Uh, no, thank you. And um, yeah, feel free to shoot me an email um, or at tweet me or something, and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, respond. Great, wonderful. Well, thanks so much for um, for this first session, and uh, we'll look forward to um, really drilling down into the workflow on Thursday afternoon. So, thanks to everyone on on folks on the West Coast. I know we had some Californians online today, as well as folks uh, all the way in in Europe and around the world as well. So, thanks for uh, participating in in this our sixth Association of Moving Image Archivists webinar and we'll plan to um, continue the conversation on Thursday. Thanks so much, Eric.